All right. Hello, everyone joining us on the live stream and entering the Zoom room. We'll get started in just a minute. We'll just give folks a little bit of time to join us. All right, love to see that number ticking up. Hello, everyone. As always, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Tell us where you're tuning in from today. It's always good to hear from you from across the country and around the world. All right, we've got Philadelphia in the house. I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. All right, Chicago as well. Hi, Lauren, welcome. All right, let's go ahead and kick things off officially. Los Angeles, Michigan, more Philly. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Designer, One Work from AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. My name is Li Shan Huang, Director of Design Content and Learning here at AIGA. This is a monthly free online series that features one designer showcasing one work that is personally meaningful. We'll hear what inspires, challenges, and guides them. You'll have the chance to expose yourself to new material or go deeper into material you might know already with our guest speaker. Our guest speaker today is Christine Scheller, who will be talking about Keith Haring and how his work in reproducing and commercializing his art helped her understand what a career in design could be. I'm personally looking forward to this presentation as a big fan of Keith Haring's work myself, and it's also perfectly timed for Pride Month. A little bit about Christine before I turn it over to her, and then I'll come back for the Q&A at the end. Christine is a seasoned leader experienced in building design and user experience teams. She's currently serving as the Director of Experience Design at O3, a customer experience consultancy where she oversees UX strategy and design. She also serves as an adjunct uh, professor at the Tyler School of Art. She's been a longtime AIGA member since 1998 and has taken on several leadership roles in that time as part of the AIGA Philadelphia chapter, roles including membership director, in-house chair, Philadelphia Design Awards Chair, and then later served as the president of the chapter. So it's great to have her uh, back uh, in this capacity as a presenter today. And before I turn it over officially to Christine, a friendly reminder about our code of conduct. Please keep it clean, keep it kind, keep it professional, and we'll be problem free. So that's all for me for now. I'll turn it over to Christine, and then I'll come back for the Q&A. Type in your questions at any time in the chat or the Q&A pod, and we'll get to them time uh, if we have time. So. See you in a bit. All right, let's do it. And thank you for the lovely introduction, Lee Sean. You saved me some work there. Um, thanks for having me today, everyone. Thanks for participating, for joining from all over the country. I've been really enjoying this one designer, one work series, and I'm so happy to be a part of it myself now. So thank you to AIGA for having me and to my friend Rachel Elnar for recommending me to speak today. So I think Lishan covered it better than I could have possibly done it myself, um, but we'll just do the highlight reel here. So I lead the experience design function at a Philadelphia founded, though now nationally based CX consultancy, O3. I have some of my colleagues here today with us. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about us, O3world.com. And I also adjunct at Tyler School of Art. I'm currently teaching mobile app design. And I've had many other roles along the way, as Lishan mentioned, my favorite being the role that I played with AIGA. So long time member. Wow, I, I didn't realize I went back all the way back to 1998. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, and so member for years and then eventually joined the board, um, was on the board for nearly 10 years. And then of course ended with my presidency um, from 2017 to 2019. And since, since I recently moved myself across the country to Los Angeles, I'm now a proud member of the AIGA LA community. Shout out to um, my friends here in LA who have been super welcoming. And something that I'm just super grateful for as a side note, and we could do a whole discussion about the value of AIGA and what it's, what it's brought for me and my career and my life, but that I could move to a city across the country and know that I had this built-in design community has been incredible. And I'm, I'm thankful to AIGA for that. So enough about me. I am here to share the story of a work that inspired me in my youth and the artist who helped to shape who I have become as a creative. And 
an artist, as Leeshawn mentioned, who I am even more honored to pay homage to during Pride Month. And that artist today is Keith Aaring. So we're going to start with a little, okay, maybe a long background into how I came to discover Keith Haring. And we're going to travel back in time where I first learned of Keith. So I was born in the 70s, and that's important for you to know because when I was old enough to start defining my sense of style, it was the 80s, the decade of the most non-sensible fashion on record. And I, like many of my friends, fell victim to all things 80s. Ribbon barrettes of all colors with the ribbons that would run down past your hairline. Um, if you were extra, you would have some beads at the end. Neon on top of neon on top of neon. The brighter, the better. And oftentimes paired with crazy patterns. I mean, check out these pants. <laughs> Honestly, I kind of see really love those glasses. I keep I refer to them as like a cool mode pair of glasses, and I've been um, I've been on the hunt for those now. So. What's old is new again. If anyone sees Cool No D glasses around, give me a shout out. Uh, and hair. Oh my gosh, the hair. Big, bad hair. Okay, so like the third one might be photoshopped, but in my dreams, that's real hair. And I, I just don't even know how that happens. Um, I was probably pretty similar back in this time to the girl in the middle. I was going for like this whole like, Robert Smith of the Cure kind of vibe. And I was secretly obsessed with the Cure back then, um, much to my parents' dismay. I had posters of them hidden in my bedroom closet because my parents, I think, were scared of Robert Smith and they were also scared of me. I actually bought jeans with the fold over waist because the jeans weren't enough um, to have this beautiful fold over waist with a, you know, pinstripe detail. And uh, leggings, you mean uh, leg, leggings, leg warmers. Um, well, let's could just go on and we could do this all day. But, you know, back then we had computers, we had these really adorable little Macs, but we didn't have the internet uh, that we all know and love today. And we didn't have Pinterest. So our fashion was inspired in a, in a very old school way. And, you know, we had access to sweet rides like these with wood paneling, or I should say our moms had access to sweet rides like these. And every Friday night, we would all pile into the mom of choice's car, and we would head out to a beloved national treasure, the mall. Um, so this happens to be the Exxon Square Mall that I grew up going to, rest in peace, Strawbridges, for anyone local to the Philadelphia area. Um, this mall was complete with lots of water fountains like this. You'd throw pennies into the fountains or change for good luck. Honestly, like where did that money even go to? I have no idea. But I spent a lot of time at this mall. And oh yeah, and so Stranger Things, it's it, Stranger Things, and if you're a fan of Stranger Things and, and all the scenes in the malls, like that was totally real life. I don't know that there was an upside down part of the mall, but um, I'd like to think maybe there was. So we get pimped out and dressed up. This, my crew kind of looked like this. These are Valley girls. Um, but we probably wore a little bit more black than these ladies. But I mean, we, you know, going to the mall was an event. You would get really dressed up and styled. And we drink some orange Julius milk and orange juice together. I don't know whoever came up with that combination. Apparently there was egg in there once too. Disgusting, but it was delicious back then. Um, we'd go to a record store and check out tapes. And honestly, this sign, I just got the biggest chuckle. So this was Tower Records, but uh, we prosecute all shop listers. Don't be stupid. Uh, I can't tell you how many tapes I stole from this place. So uh, I was smart. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not proud of that, but it is just kind of funny. And then, you know, we would celebrate our shoplifting victories at the arcade. This is the legit arcade for my childhood the timeout arcade from the Exton Square Mall. We'd spend a lot of time in there. I know that you know what it smells like, what it sounds like. Like I could just, I, it, it's like I was just in there yesterday. Magical place. And then we'd usually end our mall hangs with uh, prank calls to see if people's refrigerators were running. <laughs> Back in olden times, in the dark ages, when people used pay phones, you could call someone and no one knew who was calling. This is before caller ID. So you would 
call, you know, innocent people and ask them if their refrigerator was running and then they, you would tell them to go catch it, which is just ridiculous. Can't get away with that now. So one magical weekend, we convinced our friend's mom to take us to the nicer, farther away mall, the King of Prussia Mall. And, and pardon the, uh, the graininess of this picture, it is authentically from the 80s. I think it's important for you to see how ridiculously pastel and strange it was. Um, but at the time, this was either the second or third largest mall in the States. So it was like, this was, you know, going to the King of Prussia mall, going to the Exxon Square mall was an event, going to King of Prussia was like a, an experience. I mean, you had to get prepared for it. It was a little fancier. There were all kinds of new stores. Um, there, it was a little bougier, I would say. And one time in, in one of our trips, our beloved trips to the fancier mall, we stumbled into this magical store, and this is where everything comes together, um, called Swatch. Swatch meaning a contraction of second watch, as the watches were designed to be casual, disposable accessories. This is before, obviously, we knew about fast fashion and sustainability and, and cared about our dear Mother Earth. But the Swatch store was just a magical place. It was an entire store filled with gloriously bright timepieces, like nothing I'd ever seen, all ticking together in harmony. And they came in big faces, they came in little faces. Some were really subtle, some were totally garish and outrageous. And for a small fee, you could customize your swatch watch. You could take and buy additional bands and you could mix and match them. I wonder where Apple got these ideas from, by the way, for the Apple Watch and maybe they should step up their band game. Um, so you could buy like five packs of bands and you know change your watch up every day. And, and you wouldn't use like both blue bands, you might use like a blue band and a hot pink band together. And for even more customization for these, for these fun plastic watches, um, may I present to you the scratch guard, which was clearly in response to the design fail of, <laughs> of the watch. So the screens would just be trashed, garbage. I mean, they were so big, especially this larger one on the right that you'd bang into things and suddenly your watch, you really couldn't see anything. And so um, if you were in the know, like me, you would take a little bit of nail polish remover and buff those scratches out. But Swatch's solution was to put this big hunk in plastic thing on the top of it so that, um, so to protect your watch, but you know, if you needed to tell time around six or 12, you're just shit out of luck. Um, and you couldn't just have one, you know, or so the ads advise, so this ad translates to me, I have one Swatch. Um, excuse me, I think you have three Swatches with one with a, a hideous um, scratch guard on it. But you know they were they were selling the thing, and cool kids would would wear multiple swatches at once. That was a little too risque for me, and also you know the ticking was loud enough to have the ticking of three separate watches on your hand. I mean, people might mistake you for a bomb. So I coveted those visits to the swatch store, and there were many of them. And soon, my babysitting dollars afforded me the opportunity to buy a few of my own. Uh, my first being. This this here beautiful Velvet Underground did not even know how cool it was. I had no idea this watch was called Velvet Underground. Um, it was a whole whopping $35. I think the larger faces were uh, 50. And then I moved on to the larger Plaid McGregor for, you know, when I felt like dialing out my preppy vibe, which was never. I don't know what I was thinking with this color palette and this watch. Um, and these are both great watches and I love them and I felt cool. Like I've got a swatch, things are looking up in the world, but you know, I felt like everybody, all my friends had these two watches, you know, that even though I could customize the bands and add on the hideous guards, like everyone had these watches and I wanted something a little bit different. So in answer to my wanting something a little bit different, what should appear before my eyes one day when I wander into the swatch store, but this limited edition watches with fun squiggly drawings like the kind of drawings that I was doing only much better much more confident and where have this watch has been in my life and who is this Kay Herring person needless to say the serpentine came home with me that day and I was one of the lucky 9,999 people to own this particular beauty 
And I was on a, list, on a mission to learn a little bit more about this mysterious K herring maker. Meet Keith Herring. Kutztown born, Catholic raised, lifelong doodler, Keith Herring started his drawing career at the young age of four. By 10, he was obsessed with Disney and Picasso and the Sunday comics. In fact, I, I once read that he had a bike route um, to deliver papers on Sunday so that he could have some time to look at the comics himself. And he spent a lot of his early doodling years recreating Dr. Seuss characters until his father, who was an engineer and amateur cartoonist himself, taught him how to make his own characters. And so he did. And so in this conservative royal Pennsylvania family, he just felt a little bit out of place and he would often hitchhike out of town. Um, you know, he'd go to church and feel completely disconnected from the community around him. And eventually when he turned 18, he hightailed it out of there and he headed to Pittsburgh and he went to school for commercial art in Pittsburgh. And, you know, he felt like he was doing the right thing, but that New York was the place that he really needed to be. So his Pittsburgh days were short lived. Off to New York he went and he enrolled in the fabulous School of Visual Arts. And he started to build this community in Pittsburgh with other underground and graffiti artists Jean Michel Basquiat, who you may know and recognize on the left, and Kenny Sharp on the right became some of his closest friends. And I have a little fun side story about Kenny Sharp. So totally not related to this at all, but I have to share. Um, so during the pandemic, Kenny Sharp had a moving um, gallery piece called Car Bombs. And what he did is he went and spray painted a bunch of cars around the city of Los Angeles. And they all lined up in a parade you know, beater cars to fancy schmancy bespoke cars, you know, he hand painted all of them. Um, and they had a parade in Santa Monica. And um, it, it was a really like fun thing to do during the pandemic, getting people out to look at painted cars. And it just so happens that one of my closest friends who lives out here got his Toyota Prius painted by Kenny Sharp. Um, it's got like duct tape on it. It's like cobbled together. And he just painted all around all of it. So Pretty cool story. Okay, back to Keith. So Keith's making his, you know, the city of New York his home. He's starting to look at the city as his canvas too. And he spends a lot of time on the subways and he starts to notice these black blank paper rectangles where an advertiser might place advertising. And so he brings some chalk along with him and he starts incorporating his, his doodles into these black blank paper, why is it so hard to say? Black, black blank paper rectangles on the, in the subway surface lines. And people are starting to notice his characters. Um, and so he's getting attention of his fellow New York City commuters, as well as some city authorities. In fact, he's been arrested several times for vandalism, even though he was trying to be really sensitive about the substrate that he used to use chalk so these could be you know, easily wiped away. So people start seeing these characters that he's been creating and, and working on for years, the barking dog, which you probably recognize all of these things, dancing figures, the, probably the most famous of his images, the radiant baby, which was a crawling infant emitting rays of light. And he eventually draws the attention of gallery owners and starts he has his first solo exhibition in 1981, and then he starts showing his art regularly at the Tony, Sch I always butcher this last name, Schaffrazy Gallery, who, which the gallery ended up rep representing him for the rest of his career. And at 24 years old, his pieces, some of his pieces were commanding a hefty 250,000 for, you know, the 80s, this, that was a lot of money. And I, you know, I heard stories that his mom would tell about him coming back home with just wads of cash and handing it over to her and her just not really understanding what the hell was going on and how he was making this money. It was just a mystery to her. He starts to collaborate with other artists and performers, including Andy Warhol. How fabulous is Grace Jones? Like hat, makeup, everything. And he painted her. And I don't know how many hours that took, but 
like she really was a work of art before that. And, you know, this piece is, this piece is amazing. Um, and he also collaborated with William S. Burroughs. But something that he was starting to realize is that in his passion and in, in making art, you know, not everybody could had $250,000 just laying around and could make, you know, could, that could purchase his work. And he wanted to make his art more accessible. And so he eventually opens up this store called The Pop Shop. And the pop shop was a short-lived store in New York, and he had sold his wearables and his art, um, and you know, obviously, hand painted every inch of the interior. It's kind of dizzying in there. And this is this is around this it's around this time that he starts his partnership with his friends over at Swatch, and making products that ended up in the young hands of a uh, Christine Scheller and others, and nine thousand nine hundred and ninety eight others. And it's at this time, you know, I really didn't know much about Keith. As I mentioned, I really wanted to dig in deeper and see how I could learn about him. But once I once I purchased this watch, I, I, his, his, all of his work just started popping up everywhere for me. I mean, you probably have seen this very special Christmas album, maybe not in the original um, tape and CD form that I purchased it in. But this was all this was everywhere, all over record stores. He made it into Rolling Stone magazine. The Radiant Baby gets featured in Times Square. He does a lot of campaign work around AIDS awareness. That was really something that was um, crippling in the gay community at that time. And he did a lot of ad advocacy for them. And even MTV commissioned him to do, you know, animated reels promoting the channel. So he's really just starting to pop up everywhere and become really well known. And for me, I think his work really resonated because it was authentic, it was familiar, it was memorable, you know, that he could take these doodles and these drawings that he had been making for years and repurpose them across a variety of touch points and narratives really helped me understand design and, and systems and, you know, and also that you could go to art school and not be a realist painter. My mother once said to me, and this is only a thing a mother can say, you know, you're pretty creative, but I wouldn't say that you're like a great, that you're great at drawing or painting or that you're really good with realist, realistic things. Like, thanks mom. But you know, she was right. I wasn't, but seeing work like this really made me un better understand like what I could be and what the potential could be for going to art school. He also inspired me to create like my own little library of symbols and shapes that I use. Much of what you see here in the presentation, the arrows, the doodles, the dogs, you know, I, these are artifacts that I use in my storytelling. And, you know, it's, he's taught me that I can make my own products. This is um, that my dog always has to pose with. Um, these are some things, some drawings that I did that you can, you know, turn into wallpaper and, and, that's back at my house in Philadelphia or here I had it turned into curtains or that you could sketch flowers and, and turn those into curtains. So understanding how to take, um, and I see the chat blowing up. I hope it's shout outs for fonts, but I can't check right now, but um, you know, that you could take these doodles and drawings and apply them to things and you could, you know, share them with others. Like it, I think, I don't think I made this connection until recently that a lot of that I learned from him and Andy Warhol, of course, too. Okay, so you're probably wondering, where is that serpentine watch today? Amazing question. I'll be honest, I'm not 100% sure that I remember what happened to it. I think, you know, the bands got really gross, so I know I swapped them out a few times. You could not buy new clear bands. You can only buy white and colors, so I tried to color match them, but it just didn't feel right. And I know for a while it sat in the bottom of my jewelry box. And I think that I gave it to, I think I gave it to a friend of mine, but truthfully, uh, if I'm being really honest with myself, I am like the queen of purging and I get rid of things all the time. I mean, I give things away. There's a lot that goes to goodwill. I am constantly getting rid of things. So there's a, there's a chance that this may have ended up in goodwill hands, but I just would like to think that a friend owns it and they still have it and it's in an archival box and it's in a happy place because um, I've seen some of these watches in the markets and they're worth a lot of money now. As for the Swatch store, well, it did exist up until the pandemic. 
Um, this is the last one that I went to. I was super surprised and delighted to see this store in Florence, Italy, um, uh, probably about five years or so ago. My understanding is that Swatch posted their first loss in 40 years. They were still ticking on sooner did there. Um, but that the pandemic really took a toll on them and that they had to close many, if not all of their stores. Um, so they did exist up until pre-pandemic times. And this is crazy. Who knew? But Mickey Mouse and Keith Haring are now doing a collaboration with Swatch. So there's a whole new series of Keith Haring swatches out there. So for you Disney and Keith Haring fans, I highly recommend purchasing one and putting it in a very special place and not accidentally giving it to a friend or throwing it away or anything like that. Um, for the designer friends here, I think you would love to see this drawing that I found that it's also uh, up for auction right now. Um, I think it's it's valued at, a, a, you know, something ridiculous, a ridiculous amount of money. But here we have the original drawing of that swatch with some options for colorways, the Pantone swatches and yeah super cool to see that um so this is keith's last piece that he did it's titled unfinished painting ironically um and he unfortunately passed he, from aid related complications at the age of 31 back in 1990 and as just as he had been diagnosed with um with aids he had asked the gallery representing him to get him a hundred canvases and he was going to paint a hundred paintings between the time he was diagnosed and his death. And unfortunately, I think he managed to only complete three works, this being one of them um, and regarded as his most important one. I think it's, it's a little busy and hard to, to see the detail, but. So, so much more to learn about Keith. Um, I this is crazy. If you Google, Keith Haring and click on shopping in Google. You will not believe how many products are available. I'm I'm shocked and delighted. Um, I'm delighted because his before he passed, he set up a foundation, and a lot of the proceeds from that foundation, through the sale of products like these, provide gr grants to children in need and also those affected by HIV and AIDS. Um, so, I mean, you name it, Converse, The Gap, Urban Outfitters, Blick, MoMA, Reebok, it's like everyone and their mother right now. Ruggable has rugs. Uh, you can get Keith Haring anything you want, pretty much anywhere you, you want. And, and that's really exciting. Um, I highly recommend these two documentaries if you want to learn a little bit more about Keith. So the universe of Keith Haring is one and Street Art Boy is the other. And that is, that's it. You can follow me on social at Shellerville. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. And I think we're gonna turn it over to Q&A. So I will stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation, Christine, about Keith Haring, but also that jump back into the past of the 80s and 90s. That was definitely my generation as well, and also spent a lot of time at the mall growing up. <laughs> cool. Glad I wasn't alone. We probably ran into each other at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. Um, before we jump into audience questions, I'm really curious about how you turn your drawings into curtains and wallpaper. I mean, that could oh, be a yeah. whole, whole own workshop, but maybe just a quick few words about how you do that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, it's I use an iPad Pro with a, with an Apple Pencil, and um, I don't use Procreate. I know people are really into those special drawing programs. I found a weird drawing program that's really intended for note taking called Notability, and it if you doodle in Notability and you import, and you can share your file out as a PDF. So I bring it into Illustrator, it's all vector. It's beautiful vector. You can scale it up, you can clean it up. You can actually see where you stop and start your doodle. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, so I've been, I've been using that for, uh, for quite some time. It's, it's a great tool. And awesome. I copy and paste from Illustrator to Google Slides. <laughs> Very cool. And then are there sort of like print on demand services that uh, can print them onto like uh, wallpaper and um, other things like that? Yep. Yeah. So um, back home, I, I worked with a local printer who turned my dog pattern into wallpaper. Uh, he was 
like surprised and delighted to work on that project. He was sending me, you know, pictures from, um, from the, you know, from the press as it was coming out. Cause I had no, you know, you say like, okay, well, I know this dog's going to be about a foot tall, but you just don't have a sense of scale until you actually see it in person. So, um, so that was a printer that I worked with back in Philadelphia and I'm so sorry, I can't remember their name, but I love, and anyone who from work will tell you, I love society sex. It's such a great store. I've done doodles. I've uploaded them to there. You can get a pillow printed. You can get a rug printed. Um, you can open up a shop, you know, just for you, which is typically how I use it. But as an artist, you can also sell your work, promote your work and get paid um, and earn commissions on the work that you sell. Wonderful. But definitely work with your local printers if you have them. Yeah. I like small business. It looks like Emily in the chat says, uh, we print in San Diego. So folks in Southern California get in touch with Emily Wrangler there. Um, and to reiterate the Note-taking app is called Notability. Um, and then also to reference something that you showed earlier, Christine, uh, that final Keith Herring painting is called uh, The Last Rainforest. And I posted a link to that as well. Folks want to look that up. Like it, it's so detailed. I had never actually seen that piece before um, where it's like both so iconically Herring yet very different because it's just, it's yes. so um, like, it's a pattern. It feels like it's a, a textured thing rather than like a kind of graphic thing. It's It feels like a departure from his work. And by the way, I did see two different names for that, the last drain for us and then something unfinished. So uh, I don't, I'll have to do a little research on that too. Definitely check that out. Uh, we've got a question from Joey in the Q&A and also an invitation for other folks to type in your questions. I'll read them out for you all. Um, Joey starts with an observation. One thing that strikes me about Keith's work is how unedited and instantaneous they are. Can you speak about how the planning and editing um, in his work and in your own work, how does that work? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I can't speak to his process, but I can tell you that, you know, he started drawing at four. So it seemed to have really, you know, gotten the consistency down. Um, you know, I've seen him work in chalk, in paint, in marker, and it's always a consistent, beautiful line and like perfect circles and perfect shapes. Um, you know, I think that just comes with practice. I make terrible shapes. And I really, um, that's the beauty of working digitally is like, no one sees the terrible shapes. I, my circles are never circles. My squares are never squares. I do my darn best. I try not to edit things down, but just keep redrawing, keep, keep redrawing. Um, sometimes have reference for things that are a little bit more complicated, but I think I, I personally could probably stand to do a little bit more practice too. Awesome. Um, been doing some Googling as we talk as well. Looks like The Last Rainforest, which is that uh, Keith Haring piece, sold at auction for 4.1 million pounds, British pound sterling back in 2001. So Amazing. it is out there and owned in a private collection. Yep. It, it, it's so interesting that, um, I, I mean, it's just wonderful. And I hope that foundation is, is continues to thrive and grow through through those proceeds. And I think his parents are still alive, if I'm not mistaken. His, his family, he's got sisters and his parents and they're still around. So hopefully they're continuing to advocate for, you know, people just learning more about him. Uh, there are a couple questions I think that are related about, I think they're more speculative questions for you, Christine, about um, how Keith Haring's work might have evolved in a more digital world. Um, Mike was mm -hmm. saying, I love how tangible the 80s were, but sadly malls are closing left and right. Um, what do you think would have inspired Keith Haring in our digital world? You know, I, both of those, those are great questions. I, it's something that I've been thinking about and kind of having conversation with friends about too. You know, the, the whole concept of commercializing his art and commercializing what he did. I mean, the pop shop was controversial. You know, it, it, Andy Warhol was controversial. And uh, making art accessible and available to a larger audience that became with, you know, mixed emotion. I'm personally all for it. I actually think uh, kudos to him. You know, I don't know about the t-shirts that the Gap is selling. I, I sort of love the sneakers. I mean, I have some selfish rationale for the things that I like and don't like. Um, I probably would be picky about the brands that I would want my, my artwork on. And I sort of wonder if he might be too. I'm interested to hear what the audience thinks about that. Um, 
my Gatsby, I miss the malls too. I, I don't know. I'd be, I don't know how Keith Haring would exist in a world like, like today um, or how I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't know what can replace that. And I think that there seems to be a lot of nostalgia for a stranger thing. I mean, I think for our generation and for people who didn't get to experience going to a mall, uh, it really was a special time and it, 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 you just don't have that connection digitally. So I'm not sure how that would, how that would play out for him now. Totally. Curious and I to feel hear. Like I'm curious to hear other people's thoughts there. Yeah, sorry. And I was going to connect the dots back to what we were talking about before uh, that question about like the editing process. And it just has me thinking about how there is this kind of cultivated childlike quality to Keith Haring's work, which I think he really um, worked on. There's a couple quotes from him referring to children. One is children know something that most people have forgotten. And another one where he says, children are the bearers of life in its simplest and most joyous form. So it's definitely something that he was inspired by like looking at kids drawings and like even working with kids or seeing kids uh, do things. Um, and so I feel like there's a legacy to that too where he really tried to cultivate that even when dealing with adult themes like HIV AIDS and, and things like that. Yeah. Interesting. There's something really naive and, and, you know, fresh about his work too. I mean, he didn't edit himself. You'd see him paint these giant paintings. And I remember watching a video in one of the documentaries where he's just painting this thick, continuous black line of pattern on the floor. And he's in a state like, like a kid gets in a state when you're playing with your toys or you're just in another world and there's no eraser. There's no white paint to fix what's going wrong, but it's just like a continuous pace. He's really smooth. It's super confident. Um, I think that's hard to tap into. I think drugs played a big part of that for him too. Unfortunately, a lot of times he was he was pretty um, you know inebriated when he was finding those end states. But um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to, that I can see that childlike comparison. Yeah, I think there's another thing too about just how prolific he was in the, like the unofficial pieces. Like I met somebody recently who's a longtime New Yorker who apparently met Keith Haring while Keith Haring was like drawing in the subway in the 80s. And Keith Haring like did an original painting on this guy's backpack, which he still has kept in a glass oh case, my. but it's not like, I oh mean, he was gosh. there, so he knows that was, it happened, but since there's no photo or authenticity, like no certification of authenticity, like he can't like sell it at auction, but it is like really personally valuable. So there's stuff like that probably everywhere, like the swatch watches. Totally. Wow. What a lucky, lucky person. I think that's right. I'm glad that it's being well-preserved. <laughs> So any other audience questions out there? We've got about five minutes left. In terms I'm catching of, up uh, on the chat. Yeah. Uh, I I'm guess glad, I'm curious yeah, about, see, I think, oh, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> no, I was just gonna say, I, I think, you know, people are, I see some comments about the 80s stuff, like definitely um, agree that some of that stuff is 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 kind of cool. I would love those breaths again, like warmers are great, so. Glad that people are enjoying the 80s. I think you have a couple of questions about sure. where you're finding inspiration now. Um, gosh, you know, I love street art. I took a drive yesterday to visit uh, a friend down in San Pedro area and came back and like, I saw some really great typography on, an, on a bridge and it just kind of perfectly stretched across. It was really thin. Um, it was, you know, thin in height, it wasn't very, it was kind of squat and really wide. Um, I don't think I'd look for it. You know, I like, look, I love street art. I like old stuff. I, I love going to, you know, one thing about, I love about living out here in Los Angeles is there's like a market every weekend and, and these markets are just full of beautiful old typography crazy patterns, color systems. You know, I like looking at things that have history and character or a story, whether that is new graffiti or street art um, or something old that's, you know, been in someone's family or on a shelf for years and just wondering and imagining like, what was that before? Um, I think I'm just, it's kind of all around. Awesome. Um, and so, 
you've showed a little bit about your own stuff as well. And I notice your um, dog, uh, I don't know if that's a, a fabric or something, but can you tell us a little bit about the, the drawings behind you as well? Oh yeah, so this is a family of, these are my dogs. Um, there, I made this wallpaper out of them too. So these were just doodles that I did years ago on my iPad. And I was working with a print vendor at the time. And this was what a cool gift he was giving to his, some of his larger clients. He said, submit artwork and we'll print wrapping paper for you. And so I put, I turned them into a pattern and I sent them over and wrapping paper came back and I used them for years. Um, and, uh, and then that kind of, and then I blew them up and turned it into wallpaper and, and, um, curtains here. Um, and you know, my house in Los Angeles that I'm renting. So something a little less permanent, but there are lots of dogs that I had. Of course, there's a French bulldog on there. My dog's in here too. Um, a poodle, an English bulldog. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think dogs and animals are kind of always been a thing that I've liked to doodle. Nothing's perfect. They're simple silhouettes. I've got, you know, arrows, squiggles, asterisks, like those are always kind of been part of my, my family of things that I drew, you know, like my radiant baby. And even some of the lines that Keith had in some of his work, I don't know that I ever intentionally set out to rip them off, but I probably was inspired by some of those, you know, the, the radiant um, factor coming out of some of his pieces too. We have another audience question about uh, your motivation. Where do you find your motivation? This person says, once I begin drawing, I can't stop, but getting myself to that place is very difficult. Um, so I don't draw as much as I used to, but one thing I, one thing I did find myself doing is if I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm watching something, like I remember when Better Call Saul first came out, I just started doodling what I was hearing, what I was seeing on the screen. I was just doing kind of fast sketches. So it gave me a subject, you know, I think part of the battle and getting the motivation is like, well, what do I draw? You know, where do I start with this? Um, you know, as you're consuming media, if you're doing something as mindless as watching TV, it's, it's nothing to take your iPad out and just sketch along the way. Totally. Yeah. Just do it. Or I find that those like 365 projects are really good too. If you're going to do like one drawing or one mini project a day for a whole year, but that can be a lot too. You could start with just a week of making or five days or a month before you commit to the whole year thing. You don't have to wait till uh, new year's resolutions for that kind of totally. thing. Totally. That's listen, that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself too. You know, it's sometimes if I've, I have a lot of sketchbooks that I've opened up and wrote like, this is the, I'm doing this again. And I mean it this time, like I actually put an accountability statement in the beginning of the first part of my sketchbook. And that thing is empty because <laughs> I, <laughs> I was holding myself to a standard that just, I just couldn't accomplish. But you know, when you're, when you're watching TV or doing something else that you just kind of is baked into your day and you're entitled to have that downtime. It's, it's like a really easy way to, to keep your mind occupied and um, not get too caught up in things and not take it too seriously. Just be light about it. Totally. Uh, so the final, I guess this is more of a comment than a question. Um, Anonymous was saying, I saw Keith's, Keith's mural drawing in the LGBT community center when I visited NYC. It was fascinating to see how a simple theme and motif was explored in many ways. I think this is referring to the mural on the wall in the uh, LGBT center in New York City. It's basically just a, a black and white mural that was in a bathroom or a, a storage room or something. But folks who are in New York or visiting New York, you can check it out or check out the mural online. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. All right. Well, we are at time. So Christine, thank you again. And thank you all for joining us for One Designer, One Work. Uh, this was the June edition. We'll be back next month for the next designer and their one work. So hope to see you then. Take Thanks, care. Thanks, everyone. everyone.